Good morning, everyone. Spring is here. I've worn my spring tie. It has the flowers. There's hope. Hope springs eternal. I'm going to be the director of traffic here today. I'm the moderator. My name's John Holden. I'm, I, I head the U.S.-China Strong Foundation. Uh, we've got a great panel here today to talk about the importance of educational exchanges. Um, we've got, we're into the 40th year of U.S.-China educational exchange, and it's a great story. Um, a lot of people have benefited. Uh, I'm just going to open with a couple, of, a couple of comments. I mean, it's hard to imagine um, for some of the people in the audience who are uh, younger by a long shot than, than I am, it may be hard for you to understand how distant the U.S. and China were in the 1970s. Um, it was President Nixon's trip to China in 1972 was breathtaking. The American people were were captivated by by the, uh, the the idea of an American president going to this country that had long remained off base and impossible to reach behind the so-called bam bamboo curtain. The last time that I was in this press club, in fact, was for a retrospective about the Nixon visit by the journalists who attended, who were with him on that trip in 1972. Ted Koppel was one of them. It was a fascinating, um, it was a fascinating event to see what took place uh, behind the scenes uh, to make that, to, to tell the news to the American people about that uh, historic trip. Um, I just want to, uh, so we have passed out uh, cards to you, which um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please jot them down. Uh, Melissa, I think, will be collecting them. There she is. Uh, and bringing them up to us. The reason we're doing that, uh, rather than taking questions from the audience, is we've got cameras, and the camera work is a little bit trickier this way. Uh, it's easier for us to manage, and apparently this is a National Press Club uh, tradition as well. Um, in the audience, uh, we have representatives from a few organizations, from NAPSA, the Association of International Educators, from the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, from the American Council on Education, from IIE, the Institute of International Education, from Laureate Education, a for-profit uh, company that I had, where's Laureate? Uh, someone here from Laureate? Apparently not, okay. Um, and from the East-West Center. And we also have some students in the audience who have been studying Chinese. And a warm welcome to uh, each and every one of you. Uh, so this, is, this event is co-sponsored by the, the Confucius Institute U.S. Center, which is an office here in, in Washington that um, provides uh, a coordinating function uh, for um, the Confucius Institutes in the U.S. It doesn't actually manage them. As you probably know, the individual Confucius Institutes are all um, organized through separate arrangements with universities where they are hosted. Um, and we are the uh, co-hosting organization, the uh, U.S.-China Strong Foundation, which began with two, with an initiative by President Obama, witnessed by and endorsed by uh, President Hu Jintao in 2009 to get 100,000 American students studying in China. Um, it was followed up with a one million strong initiative uh, by President Obama, again with the, the, the uh, successor Chinese President Xi Jinping, uh, to get a million American K-12 to children learning Chinese. Um, I've been CEO for uh, six and a half months, um, and my focus um, is obviously to continue uh, championing and uh, facilitating it, um, study abroad and the study of Chinese language. But beyond that, the bigger mission of the U.S.-China Strong Foundation, uh, we say, is to strengthen American, under, uh, American capacity to understand China. This, there's a linguistic dimension to this. Learning the Chinese language is, is clearly very important, but it's neither necessary nor is it sufficient to acquire a working understanding of, of China to enable you to be successful in different walks of life. And the other thing we're doing um, as part of that effort is trying to connect young people with careers that will enable them to use their China studies background. So we're uh, next month, May 31st and June 1, together with the Sigur Center at George Washington University, 
we will be hosting the China Careers Summit for 125 university students, and we will we have uh, dozens of speakers from different walks of life, government, education, uh, private industry, and so on, who will share their perspectives on possible careers these uh, students uh, could and should uh, consider. So um, you all have handouts um, with bios of the people you're seeing uh, in front of you, and so I'm not going to go into um, uh, introductions of, of them in, individually. I just will say it's, uh, it's fun to see Madeline Ross and Matt Salmon, who I've known for a long time again, and to, and to meet Harvey and Winston for the first time today. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your perspectives. And I thought what we'd do um, is just go uh, one by one and have each of our speakers uh, offer their, their thoughts about the importance of, of educational exchange and in their own experience, um, what lessons uh, they've, they've drawn from their thinking about this issue and any recommendations they might have. And we're gonna have, a, we'll, we'll have this very interactive. Uh, anybody has a question, you're, you all have mics, so you don't, you're not dependent on me. <laughs> um, so you're welcome to, do feel welcome to uh, uh, interject or make additional comments or questions as we go through. But Madeline, uh, please lead off. Okay. Um, it's an honor to be here with my distinguished fellow panelists and um, to have a chance to share my own story a little bit uh, of U.S.-China education exchange. And I have both a personal and a professional side to it. Um, it started as a deeply personal experience and goes all the way back to the Nixon visit that John mentioned in 1972 when I was an impressionable high school student and glued to the television, and I decided that it was a fascinating part of the world I knew nothing about, and that I was going to learn to speak Chinese and go there someday. So uh, I was able to turn that into action when I got to university and studied Chinese, Chinese history, Chinese language, and immersed myself, and like many of us at the time, I went to Taiwan to study, uh, in my case, for a summer, because China was not open to students. But I was lucky to graduate in 1979, and wonder of wonders, we had just established full normalized relations with China, and in 19, the end of 1978, beginning of 1979, a very small number of students started to go back and forth. So I was determined to be one of them. And that was a really hard thing to do because the only American students who were being offered uh, visas to go to China were advanced graduate students who were sent by the Committee on Scholarly Communication of the People's Republic of China. And for those of you who uh, know US-China Education Exchange from the early days, that was a critical organization that helped uh, Americans. And so I wasn't qualified for that, but I eventually was able to secure a fellowship and a position teaching English part-time in Shanghai at Fudan. Uh, I knew that I had this really great and rare opportunity. There were just a handful of, Amer of Americans. Uh, I had an amazing year where I was sort of immersed in the university life as a teacher, as a student. Um, Shanghai was a very open place in 1979 compared to Beijing where I knew other students. We had opportunities to really visit with people and go to their homes and the people were extraordinary. There were um, just a small uh, number of universities open at the time because universities had been basically closed for 10 years during the Cultural Revolution. The number of students who'd been able to secure a seat was very small. It was about 1.5% of the eligible student population in China at the time. And these were extraordinary people uh, who had somehow kept alive their learning during those 10 years and um, managed to pass this really difficult Gaokao Chinese college entrance exam that 
that still is the bane of the existence of Chinese high school students. So long story short, I uh, almost 40 years ago was able to go to China and experience university life. And um, then professionally, I didn't immediately get into the field of education exchange. I worked for almost 15 years on the um, economic and business side of things. Um, a long time as editor of the China Business Review and some other things. And then in the early 2000s, uh, I began to think of something different. And I um, realized that education was a really exciting field because American universities were beginning to really take notice of China. They'd been getting some students from China since the early 80s. But the numbers were growing, and there were all these grassroots kind of connections developing between faculty and scholars. So I, um, for the last almost 15 years, have been working in educational exchanges, first at a large public university, and now at Johns Hopkins. And I think we'll have a chance to talk more about that later. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, my, um, Madeline's younger than I am. I was actually um, already doing Chinese at the university when, uh, when Nixon went, uh, went to China. Uh, my father thought it was, I was extremely smart. He said, this is going to be super useful to you eventually, learning Chinese in 1971. And I, I said, Dad, come on. We don't have, we, you can't even go to that country. How can it be useful to me? But my dad was right. Fathers are always right. Um, <laughs> Our ne next speaker is Matt Salmon. I had the pleasure of getting to know Matt when he was in Congress in the mid-90s, 1994. He was elected to Congress, and he was the only uh, Chinese-speaking member of Congress at the time. And I don't know if we'd ever had anyone previously in Congress in, in you know, 100 years ago who'd had – I have a vague recollection that there had been somebody who had spent some time in China who had been elected to Congress. But anyway, he was the most um, – uh, he, he's a fluent Chinese speaker. Uh, he's been in, he served uh, five terms in Congress. Now, now is at ASU. Was very active in in working to get China into the WTO. Um, something that he and I both still agree was a good thing. Matt, thank you very much, John. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, as I walk down memory lane, I think about uh, about 41 years ago. I received a letter in the mail from my church uh, asking me to go on a mission to Kaohsiung, Taiwan. And I didn't even know where Taiwan was. I was a senior in high school, and I, I, I got to apologize. I didn't even know where it was on the map. Uh, and then I was sent to a language training center in Provo, Utah. And we got there on Wednesday. And on Sunday, we were forbidden to speak in English anymore. We did a lot of grunting and pointing. But it was very, very. Uh, uh, very intense, 24-7, uh, and then after two months of uh, a very intense uh, Mandarin training, I was uh, sent to Taiwan, and I lived there for two years. In fact, I was there when uh, normalized relations with China occurred in 1979, and it wasn't very fun to be there at that time, to be honest with you. The people in Taiwan weren't very happy about it. But I, I, I've got to tell you, I have a strong place in my heart uh, uh, for Taiwan as well. I've been uh, to Taiwan three times in the last year. I've attended the swearing-in ceremonies of three presidents of Taiwan, Li Denghui, uh, Chen Shui-bian, and, and now Tsai Ing-wen. Um, and uh, I think that country has progressed much. But I have such a strong feeling for the importance of learning about cultures and language, especially of countries that are very, very important to the United States. And uh, you'd have to live on another planet to not understand how important uh, the relationship between the United States and China is. Um, it is si the single most important bilateral relationship that exists in the world today. That because uh, the two world super economies uh, or uh, excuse me, super, uh, the, the, the superpowers in the economies uh, have to have a positive relationship. And now, as we've seen in the last several months, uh, China's willingness to really step up to the plate with North Korea, we're starting to see some things, uh, some real positive movement. And hopefully, uh, that will have a, a very, very good outcome, because I think the whole world uh, will benefit uh, if, uh, if it does. But uh, 
Uh, my niece uh, spent a year in China teaching English. Uh, and uh, my son, uh, Matthew, uh, did a semester abroad in Spain. And I can tell you that uh, literally every person that I've known that's had these kinds of experiences where they've been able to go to another country and really learn uh, about the culture and the language, they've benefited. Now, the, the program, some of the programs that we have on campus don't necessarily uh, have those exchanges that go back and forth. But um, here at uh, Arizona State University, we started a Confucius Institute back in 2007. And it's been phenomenally successful. We've reached out to numerous uh, school districts uh, throughout Arizona and many of the high schools and junior highs and even elementary schools are having uh, Mandarin, some uh, very uh, uh, intense uh, training in Mandarin. And it's been a real, real blessing uh, for those children and those families. Right now at ASU, uh, we have uh, over 4,000 students from China. And uh, that, to me, has been a real wonderful experience, being able to integrate and, and uh, talk with those students and get to know them and show them how terrible my Mandarin actually is. Um, but uh, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. It's, it's, it's been really, really fun and very, very positive. John mentioned uh, that we got to know each other uh, back in the 90s, uh, back when ja Jackson Vanek was going on every year. Uh, and every year in June, uh, the Congress would get up and just beat the heck out of uh, China. Uh, and uh, we just decided there had to be a better way. And so I was one of the people that articulated a, a strong desire for permanent normal uh, trade relations with China. And we were able to get that done. Um, I articulated then and I continue to articulate today. If we want to have a really positive relationship that progresses and a relationship where we can honestly share our differences and our feelings, how do we do that with, uh, without constructive engagement? Is there any relationship anybody out there has, I don't care if it's with a wife or a child or a, uh, a parent, any relationship that you've ever had in your life that's been improved upon by walking away from it? I don't think anybody can answer it in the affirmative. Because every important relationship that we have, it takes nurturing, it takes work, and it takes communication, and it takes mutual understanding. And so I'm a strong believer in these kinds of exchanges, especially academic exchanges, where we're able to learn uh, one another's languages, where we're able to learn about one another's cultures and music. Those things are incredibly important. And I think that the more we have those kinds of exchanges, the more we can mutually understand uh, what's important to one another, and, uh, and the relationship will pr progress. And I think that's the only way that true relationships uh, uh, progress, is when you mutually understand one another. And that's, I think, the goal of uh, programs like we've done at the, with the Confucius Institute, where children are able to learn uh, language skills and cultural skills, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, take those on uh, when they uh, grow up and, and seek their vocations. And it's so important that the Department of Defense has also invested in Arizona's uh, program because they were looking for a way to find a pipeline for students to be able to learn Mandarin in the elementary schools, in the high schools, then in the university, and become uh, conversant in their field of, of study. So if they were engineers, that they would become conversant in the in, uh, engineering uh, dialogue and the vernacular that, that, that goes with engineering or medicine or uh, you know, pick your profession. So uh, I find it a little bit of uh, incredulous that there are those that uh, consider that somehow by teaching China, uh, Chinese language and Chinese culture that that somehow poses a security threat and I would, I would say it's quite ironic that if it does pose a security threat, then the DOD has made a big, big mistake by funding our program. Uh, but I think that shows that they're not concerned about it being a threat to national security. It actually enhances national security by having that kind of ability. So I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm the head of government affairs at Arizona State University. but. 
As long as I live and breathe, I'm going to try to find every way that I possibly can to try to improve the relationship of our countries because it is important. And think about it. If the United States and China were equally yoked on developing world peace, what's the likelihood it would happen? Pretty great. And I think there are a whole host of other things, whether uh, dealing with uh, air quality and climate and, and, and all the important issues that we uh, see as a human uh, family. Those things are going to be better served if we work together with uh, the only other superpower and not against them. Thank you, Matt, for those eloquent co and uh, inspiring comments. Um, I want to just circle back quickly before we get to our next two panelists about the um, impact that the language learning had on you. How did it change you? In my case, it, it opened up a new world of, of, of art and language, music, uh, different ways of thinking and expressing. Uh, but it also taught me a lot about myself. So as I started to realize as I engaged with another culture, uh, what are the things that are important to me? As, as an American. So I think this is a, that, that was the experience that I had initially. Uh, Madeline? Um, I, ha I loved learning languages, so I had tried French and Spanish before Chinese. And I loved, what I loved about Chinese was that it was so completely different, and the tones and the characters, and the way it changed my life was that I never went anywhere without a pack of flashcards. <laughs> I just remember everywhere I would sit on a bus or whatever, I'd be studying my little flashcards to try to memorize the characters. So it was three years of studying Chinese before I ever went to China. And then I was, uh, well, actually, my first uh, trip was to Taiwan, where I had a wonderful summer and had all those feelings you did about um, being able to use the language and really talk to people that I wouldn't ordinarily have been able to. So very reinforcing and positive for me. You know, when, when I first went to Taiwan, and, and I think the first time that I went to China, I had this idea that they must have completely different hopes and desires and dreams and, and opinions. And the more and more I got to know more and more people, not just in the government, but the, the, the rank and file people, I understood that they have the same hopes and dreams and desires that we do. And every Chinese parent over there wants the best for their Chinese child, just like we do here in the United States. And at the end of the day, the policies and the things that they want to employ, they hope will further their society, just like we do uh, with our society. And so um, the more I studied, the more, while there are differences, key differences, and there are some things about the language that uh, you can express that are far more beautiful than they are in the English language. There are expressions that exist there and, and idioms that talk about life that, uh, uh, that, that simplify a lot of things. But the other thing I think that hit me more than anything else is while we have a lot of differences, we have far more in common. Great, well, we'll move on to our, our next panelist, uh, Professor Harvey Perlman from the University of Na Nebraska, and he's a professor of law, but has also been chancellor, and so you've had a, pr a bird's eye view of all of the issues uh, that a university has in engagement with China. Harvey, over to you. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm glad he asked that language question for these two, because I speak no Chinese. Not that I'm proud of that, but I don't. Uh, and rather than being uh, engaged in China because of self-generated interest, I was drag kicking and screaming there. <laughs> so I'll, just a little about my background. I grew up in a town of 6,000 in western Nebraska. Uh, went to the University of Nebraska, ended up at University of Virginia for a while teaching law, and then went back as a dean uh, at the college in Nebraska. And then quite by accident, without any intentions, I became chancellor of the university uh, and st stayed in that position for 16 years. So I had no agenda. I was trying to figure out what a chancellor did and how I could advance the cause of the university. And I had a number of Chinese American faculty members uh, suggest that I should come and visit their kind of one-off relationships in China, mostly on the research side. Uh, one was a very active international HIV researcher uh, who had a, a joint lab uh, in China, a couple of engineering faculty. 
And so, you know, why not? Uh, so I went with them uh, to China and visited uh, some universities and, and saw their uh, experience and saw what was happening in, the, in China as a country and what was happening in higher education and, and got a very strong response from uh, some of the universities that I visited about better relationships and more uh, cooperative programs and whether my university was open to that. And I certainly was. Uh, I, I do understand and support the, all of the reasons that the other panelists have mentioned about the importance of engaging in international stuff. The other thing about Nebraska, of course, is you know we're the flyover part of the country. And I suspect that we have a higher percentage of high school students and college students that have never been abroad. Uh, uh, I was fortunate to do a student exchange when I was in high school, but many of them hadn't. I, and I came back and I said, the first thing, my first goal is that you can't graduate from the university unless you have a passport with a visa other than Canada and Mexico. Um, and secondly, how could we create some things? And so. Uh, we formed a good relationship with Xi'an Jitong University in Xi'an uh, and had some exchanges of faculty and administrators for the most part. And then through that relationship uh, formed a Confucius Institute, uh, much like at Arizona. We, we teach uh, Mandarin and Chinese culture across the 500 miles of the state of Nebraska in towns as small as 5,000 uh, populations. Um, in fact, my favorite story is that we taught a Chinese in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, which is about 400 miles west of Omaha and Lincoln, a town of about 16,000. Um, we taught it in elementary school and high school, and through teachers uh, provided to us by uh, Han Ban through the Confucius Institute. And one year, five students graduated from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska High School and enrolled in Xi'an for their undergraduate work. Not as part of an exchange program, not as part of any formal thing, they just decided that's where they wanted to go to school, and so they did. Um, so we created the Confucius Institute. Um, Xi'an introduced me to the president of Northwest uh, Agriculture and Forestry University in Yangling, uh, which is as most of you know, probably close to Xi'an. Uh, they do agriculture, we do agriculture, and so we started to build relationships there. Uh, just because we all have the same interest in how we're gonna feed the growing world population with limited resources. Uh, and out of those relationships, we now have, uh, we, we started with 15 Chinese students coming to the University of Nebraska for the summer to do research with our faculty and 15 Nebraska students going to Yangling over the summer to do research with their faculty. It's evolved into a three plus one program with, Yangling, with Northwest in which China, in food science, uh, in which Chinese students spend three years in Yangling uh, studying, uh, the third year being taught by University of Nebraska faculty, and then they spend the fourth year in, in Lincoln being taught by our faculty. It was a curriculum conceived jointly and and supported by uh, both institutions. Uh, and that evolved into a Nebraska developmental experimental farm in Yangling uh, with the cooperation of Northwest, the University of Nebraska, the Nebraska Department of Economic Development, the Nebraska Agricultural Equipment Manufacturers, and uh, some technology institutes in China. So that we now have economic development arising out of uh, me being dragged to uh, China early on in my career. The last thing I guess I would say from my own perspective, um, uh, the, qu the last question I was asked is that, I, and I know the Confucius Institute thing, language opens windows to a culture. Well, I've been spending the last uh, three or four years trying to convince the Confucius Institutes that law also mm -hmm. creates a window into culture, a very important window. And I, since I can't participate on the language side, I wanted to participate on the law side. And so for the last year and now about a week and a half from now, I've brought American law students out of my law school. This year will be 22 of them. And we go to Xi'an and receive lectures in Chinese law for a week. Uh, and then we go to Beijing and we receive more lectures on Chinese law and we try and do some comparative 
law work. Uh, we've visited Chinese courts. We've had a wonderful interaction with the People's Intermediate Appellate Court in Xi'an where the judges sat around a table and were very candid and open with us, asked us questions. I remember the first one, uh, which was how can one federal judge stop the President of the United States from doing something? Uh, that created an interesting conversation and I think both from their standpoint and ours, extraordinarily educational. So that's my experience up to now. Thanks so much, Harvey. I, I, I'm curious to know, I mean, there's a, there's a perception, I think, um, that somehow the Confucius Institutes maybe are taking over the work of a, of a university. My impression is quite different, that these classrooms that are reaching out to communities, in fact, are, are stimulating interest in, in, in more advanced study of Chinese that they may not be able to offer themselves. So University of Nebraska has a strong uh, China Studies uh, program, as does ASU, and I, my guess is that they haven't been negatively affected by the CIs being. Uh, in fact, in fact, just just the opposite. Um, and, and in some of the things that I've read, they they kind of conflate the Chinese students with the Confucius Institutes. They're separate. The Chinese students are here to learn their own discipline. They don't need to study Mandarin. They already speak it pretty well. Um, in fact, they could probably be teaching some of us Mandarin, but, but the, the Confucius Institute is teaching American kids how to speak uh, Mandarin. The same person that's been heading our Confucius Institute for the last several years, uh, you know, is a, is a very, very good friend of mine. He's a, he's a great leader, uh, and we've reached out into, uh, like I said, the uh, uh, school districts, and so we've got uh, Mandarin programs uh, in some of the high schools, several of the high schools, and several of the middle middle schools, and then even several of the elementary schools as well. But it's completely managed by Arizona State University. We we manage it, we control it, um, and in the school districts that we go into, those school boards manage those programs. The other thing that's interesting, I, I've read pieces that say. Uh, that somehow be, because these universities are chasing the money. Well, I think we get about $200,000. Our, our budget is $3 billion a year. $200,000 is a rounding error for an hour. Um, so it, it's not going to make much of an impact <laughs> one way or the other on Arizona State University. And I can guarantee you that $200,000 is not enough of an enticement for us to give away our academic freedom uh, to, uh, you know, do the program that ASU thinks is going to be best uh, for those students. I, I have an experience relative to that, and I, and I think it does explain some of the least academic criticisms of the Confucius Institute. Um, when I first got the contract from uh, Hanban to sign for the Confucius Institute, uh, there were terms in there that I thought were uh, difficult. Um, uh, maybe peculiar from the context of American law. Uh, and so I rewrote it and I sent it back and they, it was accepted. Uh, about the next year when I was in Beijing, uh, Madame Xu Lin, who was head of the Confucius Institutes, uh, and I met and she said, I want you to take our contract that we use for U.S. Confucius Institutes and I want you to rewrite it all so that it is consistent with American values and American law. And when I took a look at it, you know, it, it demonstrates why these exchange programs are so important. They, were, they had terms in there that I'm sure were perfectly sensible from their perspective, coming from China, that, that uh, disputes between China, the Hanban and the Confucius Institute would be settled in the People's Intermediate Court in Beijing. Well, no un American university is going to sign off on that. Uh, that uh, everybody associated with the Confucius Institute would be governed by Chinese law. Well, I mean, if I were starting something, I'd probably put that. And when I explained to them why that was, some of these terms were difficult politically and difficult for American universities to accept, um, I formed a committee of, of four or five lawyers that are associated with Confucius Institutes around the country. We examined it, we made proposals, and they accepted every single one. So if you look at the contract now, I mean, there's this National Academy of Scholars or something that wrote this big report based on a contract that is not acceptable in any place uh, and is not 
uh, effective any place. The current contract says what you would expect it to say, uh, that uh, when Chinese teachers are in America, they're subject to American law. And when they're working with the university, they're subject to the university rules. Just like when I go to China, I'm subject to Chinese law. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding here, and that's why these exchange programs are so important. We've Thanks. actually liked the concept so well at ASU that we've actually replicated uh, the same concept over in China, and we're doing the same thing uh, with Chinese students learning English right. over uh, at Chinese universities. Right. So we're trying to replicate the same thing over there. Great. Uh, there's a Chinese expression. So these are good things that are happening. More people learning about each other. As uh, a Chinese, how sure do more, and if it's worth doing, it's worth Thank keep. You. It's worth doing hard and well. Um, our final panelist is uh, Professor Winston Langley, who is Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He's been um, Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Um, and he's currently work, work, working on a book on U.S.-China relations, uh, believing, I think, if, I've, if the press is correct about this, that this is, in fact, a, an important relationship. Winston, over to you. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me uh, this uh, morning uh, with you. My background might be a little different from my colleagues here. I was not born in the US. I was uh, born in the colony of Great Britain. And uh, there learned uh, a bit about China. And in my early education, I had both Japanese and Chinese instructors and uh, gave me a certain sense of things, although not necessarily in the most accurate uh, uh, sense of things. Uh, from a third world country, the Chinese revolution was very significant because of its emphasis on the peasantry. And in any comparative understanding of revolutions, uh, grounding one on the peasantry was quite important and uh, one paid quite a bit of attention to it. In uh, graduate school, I uh, uh, focused some of my studies on China, uh, became interested in, uh, I am perhaps the most uh, closely acquainted with antiquity uh, of members of, <laughs> members of the panel. Um, uh, but I, I grew to like uh, ancient Chinese culture and the wisdom that seemed to emanate uh, uh, from it and its pondering of many public affairs matters, including uh, human behavior and the nature of government and the governing. Uh, I therefore pursued my, uh, uh, I had a, a, a master's degree in diplomatic history that included uh, China. And I pursued my doctoral program on the uh, border conflict between India and China. And so that interest uh, 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 continued. Uh, when I became the provost of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, I thought one of the things we ought to uh, allow for is a greater internationalization of the, of the campus. And since I had been in charge of all academic programs, I could work with the campus community in that direction. And uh, China was one of these areas that of emerging interest that some of the uh, local government, uh, as well as the World Affairs Council, and business persons in the Boston community were interested in our playing a role. And so in 2006, I, like you, was out to participate in a trip to, to, to China. And uh, as a result of that effort, we uh, decided that a Confucius Institute would be an appropriate uh, institution at uh, uh, the university. Its success has been uh, immense, but it is part of a broader exchange program with 
uh, uh, with China. I'll just give a few uh, examples. Uh, we have uh, uh, an, an International Visiting Scholars Academy uh, as part of our global program uh, uh, at the university. Uh, scholars come to the university from throughout the world. They remain with us for a semester or a year. Uh, since its establishment, the, uh, the majority of those scholars have come from China, interacting with American scholars in a variety of fields, although the humanities have uh, dominated that, uh, that area. We have our normal uh, uh, exchange programs with uh, Chinese universities, Renmin University in particular, because of its uh, association with the Confucius Institute. Uh, but we have another university in the West, uh, um, Shanxi uh, University, Shanxi Normal University, is one which interacts very well with our College of Education and uh, Human Development. We, have, we host programs, uh, the uh, uh, Fulbright Hayes programs, for example, uh, that allows it sponsors students from throughout the United States, uh, with some 27 universities participating and going to China for uh, uh, studies. We have an institute for international and comparative education. And within it, there is a center for US Chinese education. And many China scholars come to the US uh, uh, sometimes for retraining to uh, upgrade their degree profile. Uh, they work with us uh, in uh, a number of programmatic areas. We, of course, the Ch Confucius Institute has worked with a broad range of uh, elementary, middle school, high school students in New England. Um, it has uh, led in a, a, a national uh, speech competition program each year uh, for high school students and for university students. These are students from 140 high schools in the United States uh, uh, who are learning uh, uh, Chinese language that come to demonstrate their competence within the language, as it were. Um, uh, that gives, gives you a flavor. We also have a program with judges, uh, Chinese judges coming to the United States, living with American judges and our judges from Massachusetts going to China, living with Chinese judges, as it were, and learning from them, uh, et cetera. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have a little conversation here, but while we're doing that, uh, if you'd like to pass any questions or comment cards to Melissa, please do so, and we'll uh, take a look at those in just a minute. We'll open this up to uh, a, a broader conversation with you, the audience. So it's interesting. If you think about the numbers involved, it's, um, we currently have 350,000 Chinese students um, studying in the United States. Uh, the number of Americans studying in China, is, it's a bit tricky because the number that you get from the Open Doors um, study is around 14,000 or a little less, but the Chinese visa numbers are a little closer to 20,000. But the thing that's different about the, the imbalance, and aside from just the numbers, it's that the American students who go to China don't stay long. They will go for a, for a, a couple of months, they'll go for a semester or a quarter. Um, they don't usually typically stay for very long, and whereas the Chinese students are, are doing masters and PhDs, they're doing four-year uh, college degrees, they're sometimes coming now for, for high school. So the, the depth of engagement is quite different in both directions. You know, clearly there's a big imbalance, and that's never gonna, it's never gonna be equal, uh, probably. I, I can't see that it would be. Nor is it ever going to be likely that the percentage of Americans learning Chinese or speaking Chinese is going to equal the percentage of Chinese who know English. And that's partly, it's simply because 
English is the common language of, of, um, of commerce and diplomacy and academics around the world. So if you want to learn a foreign language, if, if it isn't your native language, English would be the, your first choice, uh, and Chinese would not be. So um, when we talk about, when, when I advocate learning Chinese, I'm not saying Americans should learn Chinese and not learn Spanish, um, but they, I might say they should learn Chinese and forget about German, uh, which is a nice language. My daughter studied German, but uh, if you go to Germany, you can do pretty well in English, and the culture isn't that dramatically different that it's going to surprise you an awful lot, uh, even though it's worthwhile doing. Uh, so, uh, but what we need to have is, uh, uh, we need to have more people being introduced to, to China. It is an important country. It is getting important, more, more important daily. And it will be, despite the, the rocky road that we're seeing in the relationship at the moment, it's going to continue to be uh, very important for the United States. And this relationship has got to um, mature and, and further develop. So there'll be plenty of things for people to do who understand this country. Matt? John, I mean, it, it's obvious that from an economic perspective that speaking the language that uh, over a third of the consumers in the world speak uh, it, it is a good thing. But I, I think there's other things as well, um, as was mentioned. Um, you know, when, when we go to other countries speaking their language, we happen to tell them a little bit about ourselves. And I think one of the biggest things that we have to es export are our ideals. I'm a big believer, and I always have been, in, in the fundamental human rights that every human in the world should enjoy. They aren't just human rights that Americans should enjoy. They are human rights, they're basic human rights that everybody in the world should enjoy. Do we have a better chance of improving the human rights situation in China if we can speak in their language? I think we do. And I think that that, that stands to reason with literally any issue or problem that we're trying to work on with China. If we care enough about the relationship to actually learn their language, that speaks volumes. Nelson Mandela said uh, once that when you speak to someone in another language, you're speaking to their, to, their, their, to their mind, but if you're speaking to them in their own language, you're speaking to their heart. And uh, I thank Trevor Noah for that, uh, for that uh, citation, by the way. Um, so yeah, language is, 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 um, is a way to communicate ideas and, uh, and to do so in, in ways that you can't do otherwise. Just a thought on the language and the numbers. Um, as you said, the number of Chinese who study English uh, dwarfs the number of Americans. And the number of Americans who go to China every year is a tenth of the number, actually even less than a tenth of the number of the Chinese who come here. And I've, there's some hand-wringing over that, but I think it's more productive for us to focus on the quality of the experiences because there's just a certain amount of basic math here that we're never going to have the same demand in our country. What, what, what does worry me is that the numbers of Americans studying Chinese and going to China has actually been going down since about 2013, when I think by some counts it was closer to 25,000. Um, now it's at 20,000 or less, depending on how you count it. So uh, I think we need to be very uh, aware that we need to train people in understanding China and try to keep on top of why are those numbers going down. Um, the kind of program that I'm involved with at Johns Hopkins is dealing with the other end of the spectrum from the early language learners that are studying in Confucius Institutes. Uh, we have a program that's a graduate school and it's only for uh, students who are already very advanced in their language ch a study and can take courses in Chinese uh, and for Chinese students who take courses in English and they study graduate uh, work together. But in any case, I think across the board we need to try to keep um, our programs going in China that um, will introduce Americans to this country. 
We need to try to find out why the interest is going down. And we can do little things to improve the experience by um, changing the type of study abroad programs, really focusing on the quality of the program and not too many schools have just added these programs that are a study abroad, but what you're really doing is almost a, a form of tourism, and it's too yeah. short. Yeah. So we can really improve things like that, address those issues, um, and that will help with the language situation. Right, yeah. I say, yeah. Please, yes. Might I say something here? Um, I think one of the reasons why English has become so important as a language to learn has something to do with uh, uh, the standing of Britain earlier and then the US globally. It has something to do with the economic uh, 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 primacy. It has something to do with the technical and scientific primacy, etc. If China is becoming increasingly technical and scientifically uh, developed, then there will be increased need for the Chinese language. Uh, when I was going through graduate school, the, the old pattern was that I had to take German because German science was so, uh, uh, so much a part of uh, the Western and global uh, effort, etc. Uh, so, uh, the second uh, 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 reason why I think we have an obligation, uh, I think under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration, is that we have a right as human beings to have access to information across frontiers. And if language is a barrier, then I think we're limiting ourselves, as it were. And the third element, I, I, I reflect on the constitution of UNESCO here, is that if we are going to have peace at all on human security, it's not going to come from the United Nations Security Council. It's not going to come from the financial institutions of the world. It's, it's going to come as a result of our getting rid of the stereotypes we have of people, that we understand them very well, and substitute in its stead a form of intellectual and moral solidarity. And I think language and culture leads us in that direction. Indeed. Um, let's talk just for a second before we get to the questions. Uh, quite a few of them fall into general several categories, so we um, don't have quite as many questions as it may appear. Um, I want to talk a little bit about obstacles. Um, you know, we have uh, the one that comes to mind uh, first and, f and foremost to me running a not-for-profit organization is funding, money. Because if you want to uh, switch over and, and um, start teaching more Chinese in high schools and, and, and colleges and so on, you need a budget for that. And you're often taking money from some other program in order to fund these. Any other uh, comments about that or about other obstacles that we see to educational Talent. exchanges? I mean, being able to get the, the actual instructors. Right. Um, you know, and that goes with what you just said about resources, uh, you know, finding the revenues or the resources to take care of it, but finding the talent pool uh, of people that are able to go in and teach. What about the, the you know the politics? We, we're sitting here today in in Washington D.C. where we've got a national conversation about global issues and so on, and China is very front and center and all of that. But I just came back from Louisiana last week, and uh, China looks very different from New Orleans than it does from Washington. Uh, New, Louisiana is the fourth largest exporter or exporting state in in the United States. It runs a um, a $6.6 billion trade surplus with China, uh, actually. And there's uh, $3 billion of Chinese investment coming into the state uh, in petrochemical processing. So they're very engaged with, with China, and, don't, and they're a little bit curious why it looks so different here. I'm wondering if, if in, in, in Massachusetts and in Nebraska, if you have a similar sense that there's a demand there that, that we're 
not sensing here, perhaps, in Washington? Well, our, in Nebraska, our, I mean, our major economy is agriculture, and uh, there are a lot of people that eat in China. Uh, and we've made major efforts, uh, successful up to now, uh, to increase exports of beef and, and corn and soybeans. So this tariff situation is, is not playing well in Nebraska. And you can see even our very conservative Republican congressional delegation acknowledging that that's a, a, an issue. Uh, I think we, we have uh, very few natural resources unless we look at human beings as it were. Um, education happens to be uh, a most important resource there. Biotechnology, information technology, etc. And these are areas uh, in which the region and the Commonwealth uh, depend. Um, uh, China wants to have access to uh, these. We also want to have access to um, some of the things that uh, China has learned. We, we have a doctoral program in gerontology, for example. And um, uh, China has done some reflection in, that, in this area. And we are doing some comparative studies together. Uh, we'd like to pursue certain joint programs there. We also have an interest in uh, um, looking at China's success in certain areas of engineering and see the extent to which we might be able to learn from that area of endeavor. Yes. Interesting. Let's go to the first uh, question I'm going to pick. Uh, it's from Joanne Hartman from NAFSA. Uh, she writes, uh, there have been numerous negative stories about Chinese students in the press recently. What impacts and consequences have you seen? How can universities continue to welcome and support Chinese students on campus? Any volunteers take that question? Um, I, don't, I don't know what the reference is, but we've certainly not had any more problems with our Chinese students than we have with our American students. I mean, they are <laughs> all college students, so uh, that's, that's, you know, a lot of positives and a few negatives. But we have 2,000 students on our campus out of a campus of 25,000, and there's no, been no, cons no difficulties. And Madeline? Um, I'm not directly engaged at the moment with um, undergraduate students from China because I'm in a graduate school, but I have been in the past. I think uh, one of the reasons for this increase in reports is just if you look at the number of Chinese students coming to this country and how fast it's risen in the last seven years, it's really been extreme. And the number of students coming at lower and lower levels at um, college age and now even high school age. So I don't think that Americans have been totally ready for that number and it's been a question of uh, some things have started to happen that really are were very rare for the first 25 years of US China exchanges there's been sloppy admissions policies there's been some cheating there's been a, a number of students who are brought in who aren't really appropriately prepared to be there and they're not integrated into their campus because the campus is overwhelmed so those things have to gradually be worked into the system and I know that a lot of universities, big universities in the um, Midwest and areas where they haven't had such a large population are working really hard on addressing that issue. So there's no question there are some negative things out there, but are they, um, do they somehow negate the positive things that have happened? I've worked with Chinese students in this country for 15 years almost daily. Now I work with the graduate student population who is truly outstanding uh, for the most part. You can always find exceptions. And when you're talking about 350,000 students, you're going to find examples. But people are starting to do studies more of what is the general experience. They're doing surveys of Chinese students in this country. What are their attitudes? There's a new documentary out that I really want to see. It sounds very interesting, called Mainland, M-A-I-N-E, which sounds great because <laughs> It's about what's happening in a little town in Maine where there's a private school that's taking large numbers of Chinese students. So um, I'd say it's a problem that's beginning to be recognized and addressed and that overall in my 
experience on the ground, it's really a very small percentage of the overall um, situation with Chinese students here. There's, there's uh, there are things that universities, uh, administrators can do, um, but there are, I'm pleased to say that there are some uh, initiatives taken by the students themselves which are often really impressive. The Global China Connection, GCC, is a student organization that uh, was started at Columbia. I just spoke at their 10th anniversary convention in New York uh, on Saturday, uh, and that brings together students from China, from the United States and other countries, all sharing an interest in China. They do things, that, I'm sure they have a chapter at ASU and Nebraska. Um, that's a great example. And another one I just became uh, aware of, a doctoral student in linguistics at Carnegie Mellon, who loves the, the Chinese language, has, is developing an app that will enable communities of people with an interest in, in China to get together on campus. They can find each other. I'm now at the uh, coffee shop. Let's meet and talk about NBA basketball, or let's <laughs> get together. So these are, these are some fun things. It's called Mantan Banter, and it'll be, uh, it'll be available in the fall in its, in its better version. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions about the Confucius Institutes, um, and uh, one related um, and uh, that wants to, uh, some more detail from you, Matt, about the DOD investment. So this is uh, from Hu Zixi from the People's Daily. Um, it says, recently there's a sudden burst of concern or hostility towards Confucius Institutes. Why does this happen? Uh, does this harsh rhetoric reflect the real situation on campus? And then the second question from someone, uh, from uh, Xiaoliang from Tufts, uh, could you tell us more about the DOD's funding to the Confucius Institute at ASU? Um, any details you can give on that? So the DOD has a program, and it's not just in Mandarin. They have a program uh, called, I think it's called Flagship, um, but it uh, involves uh, their, their goal is to try to get uh, people who can fluently speak the language that they've learned uh, and fluently speak about their, uh, you know, their, their discipline, whether it's medicine or, or engineering or electronics or, you know, or high tech or whatever it happens to be, that they can become conversant and fluent uh, in that uh, specific discipline. And so uh, the DOD uh, decided that they wanted two specific programs uh, in the country for a, a pipeline program in Mandarin. And we decided to pair our pipeline program with our Confucius Institute. And we made the bid then to DOD, and DOD approved it and granted uh, a three-year uh, uh, commitment to Arizona State University uh, to fund that program. And again, I would go back, if, if the DOD believed or had serious reservations that the Confucius Institute was some kind of a threat to national security, they wouldn't have in their wildest dreams uh, decided to provide grant funding you know, for them to, to do that. Um, the other question that you had, though, about why is there so much fervor, I just want to answer that with a question. Why did McCarthyism happen in the United States? Why did we have Japanese internment camps? It's because People, look, I, I'm not making any excuses because there is plenty to be concerned about uh, when, with our relationship with China. I it was the chairman of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee for Foreign Affairs uh, my last two years in Congress, and I held numerous hearings about uh, what's going on in the, in the China Sea. And I'm very, very concerned about that. And I think many of us are. I'm still concerned about uh, the intellectual property uh, rights violations that continue to happen in China. I'm still concerned about some of the human rights uh, issues uh, that uh, haven't been resolved in China. Um, but the answer is not to walk away from that relationship. The, the answer, answer is not to fold up and, 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 and get rid of these kinds of programs. To me, the answer is to have more of this so that there can be more mutual understanding, more dialogue, more uh, interaction. Uh, with one another. I, I, I think that that's always the solution to our problems. I mean, if, if, if interaction is such a bad thing, then, then why is President Trump going to be meeting with Kim Jong-un? I mean, the point is, 
And I know people have different opinions about that. I actually happen to believe you don't solve anything without dialogue and without mutual understanding. And so I believe these kinds of programs, they need proper oversight and they need to, uh, we need to have mechanisms to ensure that they're doing what they're doing. But I believe those mechanisms are in place. With the individual university uh, leadership uh, of, of each university and the school boards uh, that administer these programs. But additionally, John, um, there is going to be a, a board of directors created uh, for the uh, Confucius Institutes. And I've been asked to chair that board of directors. And we're going to put a, a, a board together very, very soon. And the goal is not to rubber stamp what's going on, but to ask the tough questions and to make sure that uh, we have best practices in place and that the objectives that we have in higher education about academic freedom, that those things are all being respected and, and adhered to. You, Matt, you've, I'm gonna, um, you've answered quite a few of the other questions that were on these cards uh, in, in your remarks, but uh, Professor Langley. Yes. Uh, I think we ought not to close our eyes to the fact that China and the U.S. are at loggerheads for at least three or four major reasons that are not going to disappear anytime soon. One is that we have a different organization of society with we in the United States think that the government ought to be small. Uh, the Chinese think differently and it's for a long time. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they're experimenting with the idea of a socialist state with certain capitalist features. We think that the socialist features are uh, uh, unacceptable. Uh, so we have a range of issues varying from intellectual property to the nature of the work of the World Bank, etc. <clears throat> Secondly, the U.S. since, arguably since the end of World War I, but certainly since World War II, <coughs> has occupied the first among equals, if one may even speak of equality, in the world at large. And the only present likely challenger to that position happens to be China. That's not going to go away anytime soon. And the, the third uh, element, uh, both countries, I think, underwent a form of colonial experience, etc. China's was particularly humiliating. And uh, if one follows the, the speeches of Chinese leaders, uh, they, they want to have uh, an equal say as it were, in the world at large. And to do so, they think that some of the way the world is organized ought to be modified. And you, you find that from central banking to uh, intellectual property to um, bases in the China Seas or in the Indian Ocean, etc. So these are things which have a spillover effect on the idea of a, a Confucius Institute. And we ought to make the case that the work of the Institute are even more important, right. given all of those likely difficulties. Yes. So then this leads to the, one of the questions from the audience is, yes, but is this, are these cultural programs part of a soft power campaign by China. This is buying love is the, in quotation marks. Uh, how, what do you think about that criticism? Is that in fact, if that is indeed the intention, uh, Chinese government believes it needs to be more influential, wants to have its voice heard, um, should, we, should we reject these initiatives f simply for that reason? Uh, uh, would, would it not be better for, if that were the case, would it not be better uh, for soft power to be the basis on which 
We have exchanges between the US and uh, China and other countries for that matter. At my university, we were talking of, uh, we have soft power if cultural institutes are expressions of soft power. We have an institute for the study of Portuguese language and culture. It's right there along with the Confucius Institute. We have the Spanish Resource Center. Uh, it's right there, uh, it's financed by the Spanish government, etc. So um, I would say it would be praiseworthy if the decision were made that the US and China should deal with each other by means of soft power rather than its alternative. <laughs> Very well said. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to keep that and use it again, uh, if you don't mind, if it isn't copyrighted. Uh, one of the issues, though, that uh, this isn't one of the questions that you've asked, but there is a, a lack of reciprocity. It's much more difficult for an American educational institu institution to go to China and set up shop. Now, there, there are some examples. Hopkins Nanjing Center is has been there for now 31 years? 32. 32, okay, mm -hmm. I, missed, I missed the celebration. 32 years of a highly successful program, but uh, one that took a lot of courage uh, by Chinese leaders and, and university administrators to accept, and, uh, but it is, it is, not, it is not easy um, for us to operate. And NGOs, for example, who want to set up in China uh, go through a very uh, difficult registration uh, process, and so that, that is, uh, a problem that Americans uh, see when they look at the Confucius and says, well, well, maybe they're not so bad, but geez, you know, it's hard for us to go to China. Some Chinese will say to you, well, you've already got so much influence. Look at, look at Hollywood, the television. You're a, global, a globally influential uh, culture. We've got to protect ourselves a little bit. So uh, thoughts about that, Madeline? That's a tough question um, because there's there are some structural difficulties uh, for nonprofits in China that are very concerning. I think we need to look for reciprocity on uh, many fronts in our relationship with China, and this is one of them. But there's also the issue that um, some Chinese, some American universities have set up cultural centers in China, especially under a State Department program that funds them. Um, and they've not been robustly funded. They're, the State Department money is running out, and there aren't private sources of funding. So um, we have to look at what is a political impediment that the Chinese government is putting there, and then we have to address that directly in our conversations with China. And we also have to look at the fact that some of the imbalance is because we're not, fund, we're not able to fund these types of programs in the same way that Hanban, which happens to be a rather wealthy uh, institution, is able to fund. Um, you know, I think we do need to be careful with Confucius Institutes and make sure that they are above board and they are never um, trying to influence debate or discussion on an American campus, but that kind of goes without saying. Right. Um, and as you pointed out, a lot of foreign governments have given money to universities for cultural programs and language programs, so that in itself is not alarming. We kind of have to distinguish between what is, uh, makes us nervous because of China's growing power and what is really um, out of the ordinary uh, practice that could be um, having a negative impact on our freedom of speech. And then, you know, focus in on those. A couple of times Confucius Institutes have overstepped the bounds and they have been closed. And I think that um, in my experience, uh, that's probably the exception, not the rule. Transparency is important and I've, I've talked with friends in the Confucius Institutes. They're comfortable with more transparency, getting these, uh, the contracts visible to um, university committees, faculty committees and so on. Um, that shouldn't be an issue. We have a, a, a question, a very Simple one, do Confucius Institutes censor? Anybody want to take that, that question? It's a very, there's a yes or no answer, or is there? Not on or, my campus. <laughs> I, I don't know how they're in a position to censor yeah. what. Yeah, I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, that just, it, it's incredible to me. I mean, maybe they censor their own conversations, but 
uh, which may be a, a, an issue that, that some people think is concerning. But since they're not engaged in political process or engaged in teaching language, it doesn't seem that there's a problem there. But I, John, you know how, um, how uh, skittish or how anxious they get when you bring up the issue of Taiwan. Um, at one of our Confucius Institute sponsored events, we invited a couple of scholars from Taiwan to come and present. And they came and they presented and it was without incident. So my point is, if they would have uh, censured or censored, they would have censored there. Okay. Um, and there just isn't a mechanism, I think, for them to do so. I think there'd be a pushback on most campuses if they did try right. to do that. But I mean, I think we also have to be honest that if your campus is planning to organize uh, an event and it's about uh, human rights in Tibet, the Confucius Institute is not going to sponsor it and they are not going to contribute to it and they're probably not going to want to have anything to do about it with it. If they actively tried to undermine that event, that's crossed the right. line. That's a different right. matter, yeah. Right. Agreed. But, you know, if you are planning that event, you would I, I assume no enough to, or you would find out not to go to that particular um, organization and probably several others on campus that have a different agenda to sponsor it. The Confucius Institute might not hang the poster for the event on their wall either, but there's a, very, a difference between that and for the, them going the next step and trying to suppress that activity. If that's happening, that is a big problem. That's right. That needs to be addressed. It's, it's interesting, when you think about the, um, the differences between the U.S. and China, we think, well, gosh, you know, Americans don't know very much about China. Um, and as a, as a generalization, the average American probably couldn't put the Chongqing on a map. Uh, that's true. And um, there, there may be some discrepancy there. But in terms of uh, Americans' understanding of China in, in the academic world, We've got an incredibly rich China studies uh, community that is producing great scholarship about China, ranging from oracle bone inscriptions and prehistory uh, to, to, to current uh, situations, sociology, anthropology, and, and so on. The number of books published um, in the English-speaking world about China that constitute original research of great depth mm -hmm. Uh, is just fascinating, uh, and it's, it's, it's important. So if you want to, if you're a, at a college in America and you want to learn about Tibet, you want to learn about any aspect of China, there are tremendous resources available. And I just, uh, just for my Chinese friends here, I would offer a question to you, and that is, to what extent do Chinese universities do, do an equivalent amount of in-depth research and teaching about the United States. Think about how many original books uh, about the United States have been written in Chinese that are so good they need to be translated into English. Because if you think about the opposite question, American scholars' works about China are constantly being translated into Chinese because they're so good. And I challenge, I think that it's, it's wrong to assume that Chinese, that China as a nation or that its students necessarily understand us as well as they might think. Some of it may be just a little bit more superficial than it should be. So we have um, two students here who are studying Chinese um, and they would like to reflect, they've offered to reflect uh, on their experience. And where are they, Melissa, can you point them out? And we can get you a mic, or I can give, give you this one if you'd like to come up. And just identify yourself and tell us uh, about your experience. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Jonathan Merrick. I'm a freshman here at Georgetown University. Uh, and my China story starts probably 25 to 30 years ago before I was born. My dad went on a number of business trips to China, uh, not speaking a word of Mandarin. and. So he went there um, usually to small factory towns um, to do factory tours. My dad's taller than I am. He's six foot seven. He's 225 pounds. He's a big guy. Um, and whenever he would go into these factories, work would stop and everyone would leave their posts to go see this giant Lao Wai that was showing up in their factory. Um, 
And so he told me that story uh, before I went over to China the summer after my freshman year on a Confucius Institute um, program uh, jointly organized with Chicago Public Schools. And I expected, obviously, a very different country, but kind of the same fascination and lack of knowledge or familiarity with the West. And I got something completely different. And I got a program where I was able to interact with Chinese students, not as American and Chinese, but as two students and, and two friends. And I think that, to me, is kind of the ultimate value of uh, Sino-American academic exchanges, is that we get to see, understand each other better as equals, as partners, and irrespective of national differences. And I think that's absolutely critical to a lot of the issues we've talked about, whether it be economics, diplomacy, human rights and um, values. And I think that the way that educational exchanges, including US-China Strong uh, supported stuff, including Confucius Institute programs, help build the US-China relationship is by forging really deep and equal ties between um, American and Chinese students. And that, I think, is really cuts to the core of how the relationship has improved over the past two decades plus, um, and where it can continue to improve in the future. And I think that it's important to understand that um, these programs are at their core about building educational opportunities and providing students chances that they wouldn't have otherwise had to study. And that was something that I noticed and has really influenced and impacted my own trajectory educationally and personally. So I thank you all for coming and for letting me share my story with you guys. Thank you. Good. And we have one more student here. If you could come up uh, front. Here you go. Hello, my name is Timothy Brown. Uh, I'm 14 years old and next year I'll be attending St. John's. Uh, it's not too far from here actually. Northwest too. Well, I've been taking Chinese for a long time, since I was maybe five. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and exposure to be a part of this discussion about learning at the Confucius Institute. About a month ago, I was a presenter at the 13th year anniversary at the Confucius Institute in University of Maryland, the one I learned. Uh, the speech I prepared that on that day was centered on my experiences learning at the Confucius Institute and experiences of going from and experiences I've learning I've had from the Confucius Institute. At the event, I learned the history of Allegheny County and its in its county ex experience of going from a boom town to a recession. The representative from Allegheny County expressed optimism on the opportunities that have come from the introduction of Mandarin by the Confucius Institute into their school system, which has provided a another favorable chance for their future. So basically this county was had a really big city, uh, Columbia, and all of a sudden the whole economy dropped and they were in desperate need of something to bring the economy back. So all of a sudden they thought of Mandarin and the Confucius Institute brought Mandarin into their county and all of a sudden everything started to go good for them again. They started to get a program where the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools will all have a Mandarin program, which led into a partnership with Fosberg. And so they would get college credits for doing Mandarin in middle school, and even elementary school. Uh, the speech I prepared that day was, I congratulate the Confucius Institute at the University of Maryland and Mr. Tway and staff on the 13th year. It has been an honor to study at the Confucius Institute for four years. I thank Dr. Moat for his vision in opening the first Confucius Institute. There are now 100 Confucius Institutes in the United States, 700 Confucius Institute worldwide on six continents. The Confucius Institute at University of Maryland College Park has brought in my passion for the language and the culture of China. I have learned art, culture, calligraphy, competed in bridge competitions, and much more, all while studying at the Confucius Institute. My first introduction to the Confucius Institute was actually in China. Xiamen. I was able to visit Xiamen 
University and saw the Confucius Institute on the campus where I first saw my first one. I learned so much about the country and I was able to use my Mandarin. I look forward to traveling with the Confucius Institute possibly this summer. Uh, it was a great honor for me to receive the People to People Award too from the Confucius Institute. The Confucius Institute inspires me and others to strive for excellence. Uh, I look forward to my upcoming challenges and opportunities that the Confucius Institute has provided for me. Learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere, as Confucius said once, and that's what Chinese has done for me. So the uh, Well, we've, uh, we're right up against our, our, our closing time, but I, so I won't attempt to make any uh, summary. We've got a very rich subject. This has been a fascinating conversation. John, can I just throw in one idea? Yeah, just absolutely. Just real quickly. Um, I know how uh, you know, these things work. And you know, most of us have experience with a Confucius Institute. Uh, maybe some of us have had a, experience with a couple of Confucius Institutes, but probably none of us have seen every Confucius Institute in the country and, and seen it up close and personal. And so invariably, somebody's going to come back and say, well, this happened over here at this school. Um, my point that, that I'm trying to make is that we are creating this board to make sure that there is consistency, that there is transparency, that there are best practices, and that the things that we as American scholars are concerned about, and that is academic freedom, that does occur. And, and so, you know, it, if there are some isolated story of something that happened out there, what we want, what I want to make sure that people understand is that we're speaking generally of, with our frame of reference. But, but there needs to be, just like Madeline said, there needs to be things in place to make sure that the things that, that some of the concerns have been raised and the issues uh, that, that we address them. Absolutely. Madeline? Is there time? Well, I wanted to say that bringing this back to 40 years of U.S.-China education exchange, Confucius Institutes have been around for uh, since about 2005, maybe. But so they're relatively recent phenomenon, and uh, I think we need to be go carefully, but I just want to bring it back to the fact that I, in thinking about this event, realize again that in, 19, in the beginning of the normalization, education was really at the leading edge of the U.S.-China relationship. The very first exchanges were of students. The Deng Xiaoping's whole mindset in terms of opening to the United States had to do with finding a way to train a lost generation in China. So education has been really important to US-China relations. I think the scope of these exchanges has been very broad and brought many, many good things as well as some perhaps not so good. So let's just remember, I mean, nowadays, President Xi of China, his daughter studied in America. Mm -hmm. President Trump, his grandchildren are studying Chinese. So this thing has. It, and, and in very many small towns, there are Chinese scholars, students. So it's a really widespread, important phenomenon. And we ought to be very careful in monitoring it, but also valuing the changes it's brought to our country, to China, and um, just to many, many, many individuals. Thank you, Madeline. Those are great closing comments. Uh, thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today and those who asked questions. If I didn't have a chance to, to raise it, I apologize. Um, but uh, thanks to my fellow panelists. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, and, John. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.